Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. I am Jonathan Little. I'm back from a week-long bachelor party in New Orleans, so I'm feeling a bit rough, but you know, I'd say okay. I actually scheduled two days of a work day where, you know, didn't have a whole lot to do. Today we just have a little coffee, we have a little webinar later, and, um, you know, relatively relaxing day, so that is good. Already lost my document I wrote up for everyone this morning. Um, I'm always a little bit nervous after coming back from a week away that the stream will not work, so we're going to give it a second to see if it is functioning properly. If you are here on Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, etc., type something in the chat box. Let me know it's working. And as soon as we know it's working, we will get to it. Oh, well, here we go. It's actually working. You know, sometimes you're lucky. Sometimes they don't, uh, they don't make many updates and, and everything still functions. Shannon says, congrats for Lexi's win. Yeah, uh, Lexi is a coach at PokerCoaching.com and she had a win in a tournament yesterday and then she decided to hop in another tournament back to back. And um, well, she's at the final table again. So Lexi Gavin, absolutely crushing it. One of our newest poker coaching coaches. Turns out, there might be a little bit of poker coaching run good. Whenever uh, we hire a poker coach, seems like they get on fire. We hired Jonathan Jaffe. He uh, final table Bellagio 10K and then won the 25K in Florida. Lexi Gavin's been on fire recently as well. So um, maybe I should fire myself and then rehire myself to chip up a little bit. Today, we have a question. You can phrase it in many ways, but it's essentially... How do you play pocket aces on a scary turn? That was basically the question. Very simple question, missing much information, but how do you play aces on a scary turn? So the person also asked, basically, when should you continue betting big? Okay, so when you keep betting big on a scary turn when you have a hand, like pocket aces, which is a hand that is, you know, pre normally pretty good, but it's certainly not the super nuts, right? Well, first things first, realize it depends, okay? Most importantly, depends on what that turn is. Sometimes it's really scary, sometimes it's not so scary, right? There's a beautiful example of this. Say um, you raise from any position with pocket aces, big blind calls, flop comes nine, five, two, okay? Your opponent checks, you bet, they call, this is smart, you should probably be betting small and frequently, so you'd bet small here with your entire range, they call. Turn is a six, nine, five, two, six. I've already ran this situation for you. If you're watching here on, well, anywhere but Instagram, you can see that we have a whopping 69% equity on the turn, assuming our opponent's range is anywhere near reasonable, which means we have a gigantic range advantage. There are two things that really determine when you want to keep betting and when you want to be checking, and that is range advantage and nut advantage. These are two very important things. On 9526, the preflop raiser still has 87. Don't forget the nuts in your range, right? Also, um, we have pocket nines, pocket fives, maybe pocket twos, right? So we still have lots of nut hands available. Plus, aces kind of count as the nuts here. Now, we do lose to some hands with pocket aces, but that's okay because for the most part, we have the best hand. And we can just continue betting very, very happily. So on 9526, it's not actually all that scary. Now, I can change this slightly. 9625, will this be better or worse? Let's see. It's about the same, right? It doesn't really matter. You're gonna find that on this board, 962, let's say it turns a 10. Does that change anything? Probably, it's actually better for us. All right, well, go figure. So I guess, I'm sorry, it's better for us because I have not uh, changed the opponent's range, so ignore that. Initial initial question was nine, five, two, six. Put making four, three, make the straight, and eight, seven, make the straight. Even then, you see pocket aces have a solid 69% equity, equity advantage. In that scenario, just keep betting. It's not actually that scary of a turn. It may look like a scary turn, but it's not all that scary of a turn. Now, different scenario. Now say the board is jack, 10, nine, two spades, Turn is the eight of spades. And we have ace of diamonds, ace of clubs. So no spade. In this scenario, see it's actually horrible for us. We only have 28% equity. So in this scenario, we completely lack the range advantage. 
and, well, not necessarily range range, but our hand is certainly not in great shape against our opponent's range. And we lack the, well, again, we don't necessarily like the nut advantage of our whole range, but in this scenario, we're just not loving it, right? Especially with this exact hand. When you have a hand in your range that does have some showdown value, but doesn't really have a lot of equity, you usually just want to check. There's no purpose in betting it. Let's say instead the turn was a two of hearts, though. Let's rerun it. You see now, jack, 10, 9, 2. Ace of Spur is still actually pretty good, right? All the way up at 58%, and that will allow you to continue betting. So it depends on what the turn is. So let's say the turn 7 of spades, that's going to still be pretty bad, right? Say the turn 6 of spades, it's going to be less bad, right? And this makes logical sense, right? As more draws complete, your strong made hand becomes, or your strong flopped made hand becomes worse and worse on the turn, right? Can we start later? No, believe it or not, my life does not rotate around exactly the people on the West Coast. You can always watch the replay. The replays are available at youtube.com slash poker coaching. Oh, also, so you have a new coffee cup. Thanks to Purity Coffee, they sent me some coffee. It's good. Check it out, I'm affiliated with them in no way. Besides, they were nice enough to send me a coffee and a coffee grinder and a coffee cup. So, thanks to Purity Coffee. Woo, there we go. Always got to help out the non-paid ads, you know? Um, so, first things first, is the turn actually bad? Right? That really is the question. Is the turn actually bad? I think a lot of people view some turns that are not actually bad as very bad. And that's a big problem, because when you still have the range advantage and the nut advantage, you just want to keep betting with basically everything, and that certainly includes your hands that have, well... 69% equity like we just saw right there, right? So next, well, first things first, the, the turn card actually is probably the most relevant thing, right? How that affects the range advantage and nut advantage. Now there are a lot of other things that come into play. First, um, stack depth, right? Whenever you are relatively shallow, let's say you have one pot size bet left, it's usually okay just to put the money in. Because in that situation, you just don't have a whole lot left. And also at that point, say the turn is kind of scary. It's often best just to get protection against um, whatever other draws the opponents could have. So an example of this is not necessarily jack 10, 9, 8 of spades, right? That was very bad. And that's the scenario you should still just give up because the turn is so awful for you. But say it is jack 10, 9, 2 of spades, you know, so we have three spades on board, you have the pocket aces. It's probably okay to still jam if you have one pot size bet left or less. And that's just because at that point, your opponent could easily have a hand like queen jack or king jack or ace of spades blank, right? That you don't mind protecting against. So as you get shallower, you should usually just be fine enough getting your money in. But as you get deeper, you have to be less inclined to get your money in. And the reason for that is because now if you bet the two of spades turn and get raised, it's a disaster. So it kind of goes to the idea of, is it bad for you to get raised? And very often as you get deeper, the answer is yes, right? You don't really want to be getting raised when you have a marginal made hand. So if you really don't want to get raised, you should be more inclined to check it back. Are we live today? Yes. What's one book recommendation for someone who's played for 15 years but still consider themselves a rank amateur? This one right here. Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. You can probably find it at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash mastering. Why is this a good book? This book will teach you how to play a fundamentally sound range, and it teaches you all about range analysis so you can crush the players, no matter their skill level. Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em by a mile. It's honestly my best book if I had to rank them in terms of like a pure, straight instructional book. Um, I have other books that are very different that I also love, but this book is the guide. This is the default guide to getting good at poker. Let's see. How much advocates playing tightly in the turn in the early in the tournament? Um, I don't necessarily remember that. Again, my, my memory is not the best though. I'm sure that he advocates playing tightly when all the money gets in. I know that. I mean, look, everybody wants to be tight whenever. Um, all the money goes in, right? But whenever a little bits of money are going in, you can be very happy putting chips in the pot. Do you consider yourself a poker coach or a poker player? Well, I certainly don't play full-time like I used to. I used to play, goodness, 70 hours a week every week. 
I play way less than 70 hours a week now. That said, whenever I do go to play, I still play 70 hours a week. So uh, at this point, we are just um, mostly coaching and enjoying life at this point because we have put in our time. That's good. It's good to have put in your time and know that you can kind of do whatever you want within reason. Are we going to do more 30-day challenges? Most likely, it seems like you all enjoyed that. So we will keep that up. Is that book good for $1,000, $3,000 tournaments? Absolutely. All right, all right, all right. Okay, when's the next book coming out? World Series 2020, this year, four months from now, give or take. So that'll be good. The book's basically done. Um, at least my end of the book is done. I have I have all the content turned into the publisher, and now it's just a matter of making it look pretty. Can we do a three, can we do a three hundred sixty five day challenge? Well, I actually told uh, my team that is what I want. It's a three hundred sixty five day challenge. I will reiterate it. Beautiful handwriting, I know, right? This actually does say three hundred sixty five day challenge. Um, okay, so next. Stack depth, very important, like I said. Okay, next, opponents' tendencies. This is highly important. Highly, highly, highly important. So whenever you bet on a semi-scary turn, like let's say it is jack 10, 9, 2, three spades, turn, turn, brought a spade, will your opponent always call with worse hands or mostly call with worse hands and then mostly raise with better hands? So will they call or fold with worse hands, and will they raise with better hands? And if the answer to that is yes, then it's very good to just keep betting with your hand, right? And that's because at that point, when they raise you, you can then easily fold. And when they call you, well, you're probably ahead. And you can, you just extracted value, right? And protected your hand slash range. So if your opponent plays in a straightforward manner, you should be way more inclined to value bet on the you know, marginally scary turns. Again, if it's like a terrible turn, say it's jack 10, 9, 8, then no, you don't keep betting, right? Because that's just really bad for you. But on jack 10, 9, 2, even with three spades, it's probably okay to continue betting. Again, straightforward players. Now, the difficult thing is to know who, like exactly what your opponent's strategy is and if they actually are straightforward. And I think for the most part, in the lower stakes games, you probably can err on the side of thinking your opponent does play straightforwardly. Remember Bart Hansen a long time ago used to say a lot in his videos, just bet until they raise you. Value bet, value bet, value bet until they raise you and then fold. <laughs> and it's kind of true, right? Value bet everything until they raise you and then just get out of the way because you're probably dead then. And that works great in the small stakes games. In the high stakes games though, not so much. And the reason is because in the high stakes games, people will start to check raise with draws, right? And what that results in is you not being able to value bet confidently, right? As they play better, you need to be doing more checking with your marginal made hands. That's just good GTO strategy for the most part is check your marginal made hands against good players. This is what we teach extensively at pokercoaching.com and we've taught it in the 30-day challenge. What is the 30-day challenge? The 30-day challenge was, well, a 30-day challenge where every day we send the members of Poker Coaching Premium who opt into the 30-day challenge an email with a piece of content. It's nice, organized, takes, uh, we try to do a relatively straightforward one this time where we're going through pre-flop, flop, turn, river strategy. And over the course of 30 days, you'll spend some amount of time each day, not a ton, maybe 10 minutes to 30 minutes, studying poker. If you do that every day for a month, you'll probably continue doing that. And if you continue doing that, then you're just going to be way better than your opponents by the end of the challenge and definitely by the end of the year and the next year if you continue putting in the work. Blaz Zerjov, welcome. Good morning, good morning. Blaz has been crushing it. Won 1.1 million on Party Poker last year. Won 250K just a few few days ago on Winamax. You love Faraz Jaka as a new addition to the team. Yeah, Faraz Jaka is a great player. He is tough to play against. I've seen his content that he has made for me so far, and it is amazing. Uh, and um, that, that will be released on Poker Coaching uh, relatively soon. He already has a quiz up there, and that will be more and more and more coming up. I'm in a very fortunate spot where I can essentially make the training site that I want to have. And the way I view Poker Coaching and Poker Coaching Premium is basically there are two 
different parts of it. One is the side of content to get you up to speed to where you do you are a relatively strong player, right? And then there's the other side of it. That, that's basically for past Jonathan Little. That was for Jonathan Little when he was a young poker player and didn't know what he was doing. Now, on the other side, we have content that Jonathan Little wants to consume himself. So I'm going out there and hiring the people who give me fits, who I also know crush, to make content for me and for all of you. What about a straightforward player that doesn't raise or bet on flush draws and small stakes? Isn't that a tough spot to continue with aces? Well, if listen, the thing is, it's like it's only really bad if you bet and get raised. If you bet and they call you with some worse hands and some nut hands, that's fine because again, you protected your range, you extracted value, and then on the river, you can just go check, check. And that's it, right? So you're extracting value on the turn and you're protecting your range, even if they do have some nut hands there. Do you play online now? Yes, whenever I go out of the country, I play a lot online. Let's see, 10 to 15 minutes, you're spending an hour on the 30-day challenges. Well, you're taking your time, but good job. I'm glad to hear that, Greg. I realize that they are getting bigger and bigger as uh, time progresses. Welcome, Spraggy. Good morning. Well, great to see me on Twitch. I'm on Twitch Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern time, whenever I'm at home, having a little coffee. I'm talking about whatever's on my mind. Jonathan Jaffe's pre-flop video was outstanding. He seems brilliant. He is brilliant. He's my favorite poker player, I think, by a mile. If you ever play with Jonathan Jaffe, he's an absolute treat. He'll put you in miserable spots, and he'll be nice about it the whole time. <laughs> Should you be check calling all the way to the river? Not necessarily, Philip. So, again, we're getting sidetracked here. Remember, we were talking about when you should keep betting on various scary turns. And the answer is essentially, depends on how bad the turn is. If it's an awful turn, like on Jack 10, 9, 8, three spades, just give up. You're done, right? Check, check, turn, check, check, river. You're probably going to lose. On the relatively safe ones like 9, 5, 2, 6, it's probably okay to keep betting for the most part because... 4-3 is kind of unlikely. 8-7 is kind of unlikely. You know, they could have it, but not necessarily. And um, you can still extract a lot of value from a lot of worse main hands. But on the marginally scary turns, like Jack 10-9-2, putting up the third spade, that's where you really do want to start deviating a lot based on your opponent's tendencies, right? So, will they call with worse main hands? If the answer is yes, easy value bet, right? If they will raise with almost entirely better hands, probably okay to easily value that. Now, what about if they will fold worse made hands, but call, I'm sorry, fold worse made hands, but raise with better made hands? Should we bet then? And that's a dicey one. It really depends on how bad the turn was, because if they will fold out hands that have equity, like say it's Jack, nine, jack 10 9 2. Well, if they will fold out a hand like ace or queen queen ten or king jack or king nine, whatever, and only raise you when you're beat, you should continue betting. And the reason you should continue betting here is because in that scenario, what's going to happen is you're just getting a load of protection and your opponent's going to give you very clean information whenever you bet the turn. That's usually fine. Another thing you want to consider, will they bluff if you check? especially when the board is not so bad, if your opponent will just like always bluff the river because, well, they think they're supposed to always bluff the river whenever it goes check, check on the turn, that's a great spot to check because you're just going to get a free river bet in against them, either overvalued hands or against the unpaired hands. And if they do have a marginal made hand, they'll often check call the river. So you're getting that bet in every time and you make it to where you never get check raised off your hand on the turn, which is very beneficial. Um, so we haven't really talked about position yet. Position is highly important. In general, it's usually better to just be betting in these spots from out of position when your opponents will play straightforwardly. And that's because if you do check, they'll just get to easily check behind and realize their equity. Whereas if you bet, you extract value and get relatively clean information. It's kind of bad for it to go check, check against a straightforward player. Now against the more maniacal player, you should be way more inclined to check from out of position because then you can check and easily call their bluffs. So this was a question we just had. Are you checking, looking to check, call down? Say it is jack, 10, 9, 2, three spades, right? That's a spot where, yeah, against a loose aggressive player who's going to be blasting it, 
check call turn, check call river, no problem. Assuming the river is effectively a blank, a blank would be anything besides a king, queen, jack, eight, or spade. So, you know, you've got to fade a third of the deck or something like that. And um, that's that. And you have to realize, yeah, you're going to lose sometimes. But by checking the turn and checking the river, you essentially always induce bluffs from the loose aggressive players. Now, if you check the turn against a passive player or a straightforward player and your opponent bets, you probably want to be calling on that two of spades turn. And then you should probably check and then fold on basically every river. Now, this makes you very exploitable. Because if all your opponent has to do is bet and make you fold pocket aces, that's clearly very, very bad, right? But you don't really have many great alternatives against someone who you think is going to be straightforward. Now, that's mainly the reason why you just want to keep betting the turn yourself against the straightforward players. Because when you bet the turn, they're going to reply very straightforwardly, mostly raising with better made hands, calling with worse made hands and draws, and then folding their junk. That's a really good result for you, right? Because you get to you get clean information against straightforward players, which is why it is so detrimentally bad to be overly straightforward. But again, this is how a lot of small stakes players play. They basically raise with the nuts, call with marginal stuff, fold the junk, and that is well clearly great for you, right? Let's see. Again, going back to playing against good players in general. It's important to realize that whenever you have a hand that gets significantly downgraded on the turn, and when I say significantly, I mean like a decent amount, right? Like on Jack 10, 9, 2, three spades with pocket aces, no spade, that's a pretty, that's a bad enough turn to the point that I would pretty much always check that against good players. Because if you bet and they call, or they raise, you never really know where you stand. And yes, you extract some value, but you don't really want to be building the pot in that scenario, especially from out of position. So be very aware that against good players on relatively bad turns, like, like right over here, we saw the uh, two of spades. Two of spades gives us 45% equity with our pocket aces. Our whole range is probably even a little bit worse than that. If I had to guess off the top of my head, I obviously could be wrong. Um, but you see, that's not a great scenario for us. When it's not a great scenario for you, you typically just want to be checking. All right, let's take a look at some of your questions. Will we be doing more of the 30-day challenges? Yes. You came for the daily challenges but stayed for all the rest. Well, that's exactly what we're going for. We will be doing more challenges. Those, it seems to have been a big success. If you want more challenge-type content, in the meantime, check out the learning paths on Poker Coaching. There we have, um, I think, four different learning paths going through various aspects of poker, and we're gonna continue adding more of those as well. Let me write down a note. Because I wanna have a lot of them. I wanna have learning paths on ICM, on satellites, on final table play, on early level play, et cetera, et cetera, right? On cash game play, on you know, weak, uh, playing against weak players, playing against strong players. As you see, there are loads and loads of um, things about that, or loads and loads of ideas for learning paths. So make sure you go through those and just go through the quizzes, go through the challenges on your own. You see how beneficial they are. You know the type of content that you are enjoying. And that's all there for you on Poker Coaching. So check it out at pokercoaching.com. Do we have PLO content? No, I do not, but I would tell you to check out Jay Nandez. I just finished editing a book for DMV Poker by Jay Nandez, and um, that'll be out relatively soon. It is excellent. I learned quite a bit going through it. How important is it to be good at math? I mean, look, I think a lot of people get really caught up on the idea of I have to be good at math or I'm going to be bad at poker. You need to understand the principles behind the math, but, um, you know, they taught us to use calculators in like 10th grade, and after 10th grade, you'd, you stop doing a whole lot of arithmetic by hand. Now, you need to understand principles, right? Like right here, do you bet the aces on the turn or do you check? Well, you can use math to solve that. I mean, look, I'm using this, this program right here, Equilab, to give you numbers. These numbers are relevant. You have to know how to take not take the information from those numbers to make a good play. But like, do you need to be good at 
Calculus? No, you don't need to go to calculus. I think it's kind of irrelevant. Can't you just go all in with aces and pre-flop or on the flop and pray? No, it's a bad idea because then you mostly get called primarily when you are beat. As you make bigger and bigger bets, you typically get called by better and better hands. And as you get called by better and better hands, then inevitably what happens is you're not extracting a whole lot of equity. Like, yeah, you win the pot almost every time, but when you don't win the pot, you lose a lot. Tristan Creative, good morning. Tristan Wade, another poker coaching coach here in the chat. Hope you're having a great, great morning. Having a little coffee. Keep up the great work. I appreciate it. Hope life's going well. What are you playing online or live these days? Online? Well, I was just in Nottingham. I played a whole bunch of $100 to $2,000 buying tournaments. It went well. We had a, what did we have? I think we had a fifth and a 2K, a third and a 1K, a second and a 1K, an 11th and a 500. It was a good trip. We won like 45K in four sessions or something like that. So that was good. Um, but I'm not playing a ton of online, only when I go out of America. Um, live, I'm just playing whatever live tournaments there are. For example, when I was in Nottingham, they had a bunch of 10K. Well, they had a 10K that you could play three times. I got to play the full three. There was a 5K, there was a 2K, there was a 1K that I took 16th place in. You know, whatever, stuff like that. Typically buy-ins between 1K and 25K. I prefer all buy-ins to be something like 14K based on nitty bankroll management. But you don't always get to pick what you want. Bravo doesn't tell you which app, which games are soft. No, it does not. But I can tell you any game in live poker that is of relatively small stakes, five, ten, two, five and lower is going to be pretty soft. If a tournament takes 7% staff fee, do you still tip? No, absolutely not. I mean, look, tipping is always a dicey topic because people have essentially emotions built in pertaining to tipping, right? A lot of people who were in the service industry or are in the service industry tip a ton. A lot of people think that if you have lots of money to give, you should tip a ton, right? I'm, I'm looking at this from the point of view of you're not filthy rich, okay? I'm also looking from this as the point of view of you have no emotional attachment to this, okay? If someone, in my mind, this doesn't even apply to me because, well, I guess, I guess I'm rich enough to tip more. Um, <laughs> But in my mind, if you, if someone forces you to make a tip, 7% staff fee, 3% in a lot of live tournaments, then you should not feel inclined to tip anything on top. Now, if you feel like it, sure. But like, realize every amount of money you give away is money out of your bankroll, money out of your family's pocket. And hey, if you're fine with that, feel free. I mean, this happens a lot at one, two, no limit, for example. Um, a lot of people, they want to get started playing one, two, no limit, yet they tip $3 every hand they win. And that amounts to, what, six bucks an hour, eight bucks an hour, something like that. So if your win rate's only, let's say, $12 an hour when you're actually kind of decent, beating a high rake, and you're giving away eight of it, it means you're giving away two-thirds of your profit in the form of tips. You really want to give away two-thirds of your profits in the form of tips? Some people do, some people don't. If you're trying to build a bankroll, it is detrimental. What event am I looking the most forward to this year? I love the party poker tournament at Bahamar. That is my favorite tournament stop by a mile. Bahamar is great. Um, I haven't, haven't done well there. I guess I have done pretty well in the Bahamas. I took fifth in a WPT there a long time ago. But um, I like that series a lot. The, the, the venue's great. The games are great. You can buy it with party poker money. You don't have to carry cash. It's just like there's a lot of good things about that one. At the World Series this year... Well, probably just the main event. Um, I have two kids at home, and I'm probably going to be skipping the middle of the World Series. Uh, at the beginning, they typically have World Poker Tour Tournament of Champions and then the an ARIA WPT, so I'll play those. And then I'll probably go back home and then come back towards the end. The Matt Affleck webinar on 3-betting from the big blind was amazing. I have not seen that one yet, but I will definitely check it out. I've gotten to the point where I don't have to watch Matt Affleck's content Um to check it because I know he just does a good job. Whenever you hire a new coach, you always have to double and triple check to make sure they're they're doing good work. But 
Matt Affleck's been with poker coaching since the beginning, and he is on point. And now he's, he's the person who makes the most content on there besides me, which is fantastic. All right, what are, what are soft cash games in Vegas? Any of them? Um, I would tell you to go to places on the Strip that are not Bellagio or Aria or Venetian. So I would tell you to go to more places like MGM or Bally's or Caesars. These are places that are not necessarily known for poker, but, well, if they're not known for poker, it means they're not going to have a ton of games, but the games that are there are usually going to be quite nice. So that's what I would typically suggest. Do you use PyoSolver? Yes. I outsource most of the work, though. It takes lots of um, time and effort to do that, so I have someone who I will send spots to. They will run it for me and send me back the answers. <laughs> it's just good etiquette to tip, in my opinion. Sure. Again, like what, what defines good etiquette? A lot of people have emotions attached to what makes the most sense, right? Why is it good etiquette? It's going to sound bad. I don't think I've ever been tipped for coaching someone. Does that mean I'm not very good at coaching? Maybe. I also have this issue. I'm pro I mean, maybe I'm just thinking about this wrong. But if you employ someone, you should pay them a fair wage. For example, I charge a lot for my private coaching. I don't expect to tip and I don't want to tip. Also, even my poker training videos. They're not, I mean, some of the stuff's free, but a lot of it, you have to pay for it, right? And I think it's a fair value. I don't understand why restaurants and casinos and whoever else expects you to tip does not pay a fair wage to their employees. They are essentially saying, we do not value you. Come here and hope for a handout. And that seems ridiculous to me, right? I mean, it seems ridiculous to me. Maybe it's not ridiculous, but uh, it sure seems ridiculous to me to think that employers should not pay their employees or pay them $2 an hour or whatever it is. Okay, we're getting off topic. Maybe I'm emotionally charged pertaining to this subject. All right, under the gun limps, 200, button raised to 1,000, you're in the small blind of queens, make it 2,100. Definitely make it bigger. Definitely make it bigger. Limper makes it 5,600, button folds, I would just fold. When you get limp raised here, you, you're just against the aces every time. Okay, 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 okay. Do you recommend any poker tracking software? Yeah, I use Hold'em Manager. It's great. What's my opinion on short deck? I've never played it. Don't plan on playing it until the game gets... Um, I don't plan on playing it until the game becomes much more popular. Didn't I win 1.2 million in the Bahamas when I was 21? No. Don't know where you got that. You're new to the world. Where do you start? Start with this book right here, Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. Check it out at johnfillowpoker.com slash mastering and sign up to a free trial membership of pokercoaching.com. Will there be software games in the morning, afternoon, or evening? Always evening. Always evening. Evening is when people are getting loose. At my final table was Ryan Doubt and Isaac Haxton. Ryan Doubt won. Let's see. Any advice for one two player wanting to jump into two five with a one K buy-in? Well, first off, you don't have to buy in for the maximum. If you're going to play two five for the first time and you're used to playing one two with a hundred big blind buy-in, two hundred dollars, just buy it again. Just buy it again, um, buy in for a hundred big blinds. Do I think Kane Callis is a strong player? I have only played with him a bit, seemed just like good GTO poker player. Is six plus course of 999 bucks. Just sucks. Well, realize, look, I don't know anything about this course at all, but if you are playing, let's just think about this, right? This applies to me, applies to a lot of poker coaches. If you are playing, let's say, $500 tournaments once, once a week, that means you're buying in for what, $25,000 over the course of the year? Yeah, something like that. Do you think that's gonna give you what? What do you need, a 4% ROI increase? You think that's going to give you a 4% ROI increase just playing one tournament a week, $500 tournament a week? Again, I don't know what that course is, but it probably will, assuming you don't know what you're doing. And poker content is very, very cheap if you're actually going to use it. Right? Think about pokercoaching.com, right? Even poker coaching premium, $100 a month. 
if you don't get in on like a, any sort of yearly sale or something like that, $100 a month, if you're playing, let's say you actually are playing kind of regularly. Let's say you go, you play two, five, no limit or one, two, no limit at your casino every um, three times a week, you're investing quite a bit. Do you really not think you're going to get an extra, what, $1 per hour win rate by studying a lot in your, in your spare time? I think you probably will. Seems very, very free to me. And that's why I've always hired lots of coaches whenever I go to learn any new game, any new skill, because if you're actually going to utilize the information, it, it is very, very cheap. Do you take into account the dealer's quality? Yes, I always take quality into account when I am tipping anyone. Do you leave a tip for the casino staff after finishing in the money, but not the last few places? Let's say you finish in 50th place and get a min cash. So Blas, in most casinos, they take a 3% tip off the top. So the answer is no. I do not feel inclined to tip additional. If they are, if I'm already tipping, someone was complaining the other day that Fader Holtz, this is what someone emailed me, they thought Fader Holtz was a jerk for not tipping on his whatever, call it $5 million dollar in cashes last year. Let's got the calculator. They don't realize that Fedor actually tipped 3% on the $5 million. $5 million times point, oops, times 0 0.03 equals. That means Fedor tipped $150,000. You're really gonna give the guy crap for tipping $150,000? That seems absurd. That seems absolutely absurd. $150,000 seems like a lot to be tipping. Anyway. If they take the tip voluntarily, don't feel inclined. If they don't take a tip, you know, tip 3%, tip 4%, tip whatever you want, right? What's my opinion on the rule of four and two as a way to calculate percentage odds? It's close enough. I don't really use that in my head while I'm playing because there's no often ranges win and whatnot, but sure, it's a great, good way to get to it. How do you remember all the situations in mastering? You don't remember all the situations in mastering, Patrick. Instead, you learn the principles behind poker that guide you to making roughly the right play in every scenario. If you can make the best or the second best play every time you play, you're gonna be better than almost everyone you encounter. What happens to a lot of people, those are just making the worst play or the second worst play every time they play and that makes them big losing players. All right, all right, all right, let's see. Only 31 likes, come on people. Yeah, click like, click subscribe, it's free. The dealer in your local card room only gets paid tips. Why does the employer not value their employees? Wow, that is brutal. Every time they go to work, they are saying, I don't value, well, my employer is saying, I don't value you. And they're saying, I don't care if you don't value me. That, that like, whenever, this, this is maybe, I must be emotionally charged about this. Whenever you do anything, anything at all, you're essentially saying, "This is I'm cool with this, right? You come here, watch this show, right? You're saying I'm cool with this free content Jonathan puts out every morning, and I think it adds value to my life. And good, I hope it does. But the employer sets up shop knowing that they don't even have to pay their employees anything. And that is, that's absurd. That is just so absurd to me. Oh, gosh. I mean, I, what it is is I value my employees. I, I learned something a long time ago. If you drastically overpay your employees and kind of let them do whatever they want based around their life, they're going to like you pretty well, which is why I overpay my employees and I let them work kind of their own schedule. And it turns out none of them ever quit me. Who'd have thought, right? Could you imagine if I told my employees, you know what? I'm just going to um, put out a tip jar and you guys can have everything that goes into the tip jar. And um, you have to work specific hours, usually in the middle of the night, and um, you don't get a 401k or any of that. <laughs> so you think, they'd, you think they'd still work for me? Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. I don't think so. Eight big blinds with ace queen off, under the gun, easy all in. You've been killing it. Great. I'm glad to hear it. You can beat the game. It's one, two, and, the, and it's the highest in the room. ROI is... Well, ROI is not really a calculation for cash games. Keep playing, 24 bucks an hour. Just play that and grind that all day, every day.
In a recent video, I said that kings on an ace-high board is a marginal made hand. Is that generally true? Yeah. Well, the, the so look, whenever you're determining what a marginal made hand is, you want to essentially ask, can I bet the flop, bet the turn, and bet the river with this, and expect to get called by worse? So with kings on an ace-high sex board, can you go bet flop, bet turn, bet river? The answer is obviously no, right? So it's a marginal made hand. What's the biggest hat I've ever worn? I don't really wear hats. I don't particularly like hats for whatever reason. They, they, they constrict my head. I don't like my head feeling constricted like this. I don't like that. Two, three game, 10% rake up to $15. Oh my God. What do you estimate the max win rate would be? This is a bad question, Con Con, because what if your opponents are so bad they put in half their stack every hand and then fold to your all in? What if they do that every single hand? Well, then you can win for a giant win rate. Depends on how bad your opponents are, right? I would say this game is going to be very difficult to beat to begin with. Can you explain the rule of four and two? All right. The gist of it is, say you have a draw, okay? Say you have eight outs. You know you lose every time you miss, which does not actually happen in the real world because sometimes you make a pair and you win. Sometimes you bluff and you win, right? This is why these odds are kind of wonky. But essentially, say you have eight outs. If you multiply eight times two, that means you're going to get there. Eight times two is 16. So you're going to get there 16% of the time on the next card. And when it comes to the next two cards, you're going to multiply 16 times four, which is uh, what? I'm sorry, you multiply eight, the number of outs you have times four, which is 32. So you get there about 32% of the time. It's rough, but that's roughly how often you will improve to the hand you are trying to draw to, right? So say you have uh, 10 outs, 10 times two is 20, 10 times two is 40. Say you have two outs, 10 times two is, I'm sorry, two times two is four, two times four is eight. And that's roughly the odds you will get there either with one card to come or two cards to come. All right, let's see. I'm glad you all are enjoying poker coaching and learning and getting better at the game. That's exactly what we're going for. Half the table are maniacs, half the table are calling stations. You should probably tighten up a lot. Yes, that is exactly accurate. Anyway, let's see. If the company does not pay their employees, they are exploiting their employees. Uh, yeah, I typically agree with that. Thanks, everyone, for all the comments. Good morning, good morning. In your state, we don't play no limit, only spread limit. Listen, Brian, I have played spread limit about two times in my life. I didn't view it to be all that different than no limit. But if you're in a game where people are, like, just blasting maximum... Again, when I say spread limit, usually it's like $1, $2 blinds, then like $2 to $100 bet, or $2 to $200 bet, or something like that. That's the game is basically the same. If it's a spread limit of like $2 to $20, then it's more like limit hold'em. I don't know. It really does depend on, on your exact scenario. Is it wrong to play your favorite hand sometimes? Oh, I play aces every time I get them. So for me, the answer is no. All right, hijack, raise first into three big blinds. We don't even know what hand we have. Flop comes jack, jack, jack two, two, hijack bets two big blinds, we blind calls, turns four, hijack bets six big blinds, we blind raises, hijack calls, rivers and eight, big blind bets, 18 big blinds, hijack calls, hijack shows aces. Big blind, you get zoned. How bad are you? Well, mm, seems fine to me. Sometimes you lose, right? This is a good example of a spot where against the weak type players, remember we talked about this right at the top of the episode today, right? How, what is your opponent's tendencies? When they raise you, do they just always have the nuts? If the answer is yes, you should fold. I know there aren't a whole lot of nuts available here, but your opponent could have ace two, king two, three two, who knows, right? They could also have jacks and they could have fours. So if they are um, only raising with the nuts, you have an easy fold. But if your opponent's anywhere near competent, you can't fold because here there are spade draws available. They could easily have a hand like five three of spades, six three of spades, Six, five of spades, ace, three of spades. They can have all sorts of stuff like that, right? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. 
Hijack had aces. I was confused. Should you fold the aces? The answer is no, you should not fold aces. Unless your opponent's a weak tight knit. Uh, you get owned. I guess you must have had a busted spade draw. Don't know what else you could have here. Where's the star of the show? Mr. James is at school. James goes to school on, well, every day in the morning. So you really don't get to see James a whole lot anymore. How sad, right? Uh, let's see. When you win the next tournament, you're sending me a 10% tip. You don't need to send me a 10% tip. I do not want it. If you all feel like tipping me or any other content creator out there, I would instead suggest you buy the content they make. The problem a lot of content creators have is that they don't actually make content that is sellable, um, which, you know, it's their prerogative. But if you are a content creator out there, I would tell you to try to make something in addition to the free content that you make. Because if people like you, they want to reward you. And the best way to reward someone, at least in my mind, is to support them by buying the stuff that they make. Especially if they're devoting a lot of time to making that thing. I'm always surprised when I see people streaming on Twitch, right? And they're streaming like 12 hours a day. They have a great following. Then they don't sell anything. And if they're not selling anything, one of two things are happening. They're either not making any money or they're selling ads. Now, when you sell an ad, as I hold this Purity coffee cup that I got completely for free, by the way. They sent me some coffee. It's good. Check it out. Purity coffee. Can you see that? Eh, okay. Um... When you sell an ad, you are saying that this person provides more value than I could provide to my own audience. For example, when you go to YouTube, if people are showing you ads on YouTube, they are essentially outsourcing your five seconds, if you watch the minimum, for like 0 0.001 pennies. We did the math earlier, and basically they, they're saying that your time is worth like five cents an hour. Could you imagine if Jonathan Little got up here and said that I think all of you are so useless at life that your time is only worth five cents an hour? That'd be absurd. Yet, that is what all the YouTube creators are doing who have ads. They are willing to outsource you to make a tiny bit of money. Now, to be fair, whenever I talk about my training content, I subject all of you to it. Some of you skip it, props, some of you don't. But inevitably, some of you do buy it. But whenever, at least, at least be happy to know that whenever I outsource one minute of this show to talk about my products, I'm at least uh, giving, giving all of you on average way more than a point, giving, giving more than five cents per hour. So anyway, anyway, I, I guess you guys have me on some topics today. Tipping, I have pet peeves. Subjecting people to nonsense ads, I have pet peeves. So anyway, that's it. That's it, that's it. We're going off the deep end today. When do we find out if they won the Poker Personality of the Year Award? On March 2nd? Something like that. The Global Poker Awards are happening. I will be there to collect my award if I win the award. And if I don't, I appreciate all of your effort getting me to the top four anyway. Money is in merchandise. Do you sell any? I actually would disagree. I don't think money is in merchandise. Because merchandise takes a whole lot of work and a whole lot of... Uh, maybe not. Depends on how you do it, right? I can tell you, from example, that the money is in digital information. Because you don't have to keep any inventory. It requires just you to make it. And once you make it, it's there. Now, obviously, stuff expires or gets old, right? Like content I made 10 years ago probably isn't all that good. Would you believe, I did the math the other day. I've been making poker training videos for 15 years. That's probably older than some of you all here. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just ridiculous, right? Where's the time gone? Um, so no, I, I, I'm not a big fan of the merchandise, but I do think there is value in branding. I, I actually do think that I could do a whole lot better at branding in general. Because if you do make a brand, people will inevitably buy your branded stuff and then promote you in the public. So anyway, that's that. Upswing gets people to stream and push their products. We do um, live study sessions with um, God's Big Toe and what's his name? Big Sixes or something like this. Shondell. We do that on Saturdays on Twitch. They get online, they play some hands through poker coaching, and they have a great time. 
How was New Orleans? It was perhaps the best trip of my my life. It was a whole lot of fun. I was thinking about my favorite experiences. Um, they had a Star Wars parade. I love seeing the Star Wars parade. But then my favorite experience, I was playing, we only went to the casino one night at like 6 a.m. in New Orleans. And there was a 1-2 game. And there was like a 3-6 limit game. And I think like a 15-30 limit Omaha game. So anyway, I sit down at Limit Hold'em, lose 30 bucks, leave. Then we head over to No Limit. I was playing with David Peters and um, Michael Katz and Danny Wong. You probably only, only know David Peters. Like literally the best poker player in the world. We're sitting there playing. David Peters can't win a pot to save his life. I'm playing with my friend Mike Katz. We get to the river. I like It was a, it was a bomb pot apparently. I had ace four of hearts on six, six, two. One heart. Checks around to Mike. He bets small. Someone calls. I call. Turn was like a nine of hearts. Uh, I check. He bets. Guy folds. I jam all in. He thinks we're forever and then calls. And he says, I have ace jack. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I lose. River's a blank. I turn over my hand, he acts all sad and confused, turns over a 10, then he turns over a 6 for the trips. <laughs> so he slow rolled me to death. I didn't care because it's just like fun and games, you know. Um, but the rest of the table hated him. It was so funny. And then we go over to 1530 Limit Omaha, and Danny Wong is somehow on the river in this giant pot, and he bets the river. It borders like Queen, Jack, 9, 8, 6. He bets the river. They both fold, and they just shows the six three two, <laughs> six three two for nothing. You bet bet the river in a limit game, and they all folded somehow. It was absolutely insane. Poker stories from uh, six a.m. at small to mid stakes cash games. Do you have real estate? I have a Manhattan apartment. I used to have three more houses, but I sold them to get the Manhattan apartment. What stakes do you recommend you play to apply the things that you are learning? Any stakes. Small stakes is fine. Small stakes, medium stakes, big stakes. We have content for all levels. Like I said, I made the site for past Jonathan Little and for current day Jonathan Little. Both. It's all there for you. How do you play at a table full of limpers? Seems like all they do is check, call, check, call. Well, value bet relentlessly. Value bet and then don't pay them off. How do you become an inner circle member? Ooh, I don't know. That's a good question. Email support at pokercoaching.com. Those study sessions are gold. Was it better than my honeymoon? Eh, close. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Let's see, let's see. One to no limit. Game's very deep stacked. You're usually third or fourth worst player. Should you buy in short? Probably short. If you're not very good, you want to be playing shorter stacked. Do you make more from playing? coaching or the investments you've made. Hmm, I don't know how much I've made from the investments. I don't really keep track of that so much. Currently, though, coaching, because I do the coaching three-fourths of the time. If you spend most of your time doing something, you sure better be making an income from it. If you're not, you may maybe you should be doing something different. I also thought it was funny that uh, nobody knew who David Peters was. <laughs> It was fun. Um, someone asked me life advice at the limit game. He was sitting on my direct left. He knew me. He like showed me, showed me my audiobook, and he said he's having a tough time winning at this limit game. And I'm like, yeah, because they're raking a lot. You are not probably not going to beat this limit game. And small stakes limit hold'em is not really where you want to be. Even if the game appears soft, and it was soft, even if it appears soft, you are probably not going to win. So you have to play games where you can have a real win rate. And small stakes limit hold'em is not where it is. How do you balance your flop check raising range on the turn? How do you decide leads versus checks versus check raises? Well, first off, you're not leading on the turn anymore if you check raise. You're just betting again. But you usually want to be betting your best made hands and your draws, right? So your flop check raises that missed, assuming you have any. Like, um, let's say the board is 9-4-2. Let's say you have 10-8 with a backdoor draw. If the turn just does not give you any backdoor draw at all, then then you're done, right? And then you want to be check raising with your nut hands plus a few sporadic draws. You play with Danny Wong at Commerce. I haven't played with Danny Wong in a long time, but I remember, it must have been like six or seven years ago, we were playing, I think it was 2040 No Limit at Commerce, like very first or second day. Um, well, it was, it was like the first hand of the session. We were playing 2040, I think. We ended up getting it all in for like 5K, I had aces. He had the ace-five offsuit preflop, and, and I won. So that was good. 
Is David Peters the guy who coached for the Million Dollar One Drop? Uh, no, that was David Einhorn. David Einhorn is an investor. David Peters is a poker player. Let's look up David Peters. Nobody knows who David Peters is. Let's see. Let's see if we can find this. David. David Peters GPI. Let's pull this up. Pull this up. Oh, look, there he is. He won an award last year, apparently. Um, oh, he's, he's on the downswing. National rank. Only number 57 in the world. He's been taking it easy. Highest, number one. He was number one in the world for a while. He's been slacking. Only uh, 32 million in caches. Not too bad. They used to have a graph showing your, showing your staffs. Did they get rid of that? That was a cool feature. Anyway, nobody knows who David Peters is. Only number one in the world with 32 million in caches. <laughs> Playing the 1-2 one, one, no limit game. Can't win a, can't win a pot to save his life. Well, I have to go now. Hope you all have a good day. I'm trying to think what I even need to say. I haven't ended a show in a week. Um, hope you all have a great weekend. Hope you enjoy your life. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy your time that you have because, well, that's all the time that you have. I would definitely suggest everyone go on a five-day trip to New Orleans if you want to drink a lot of calories and have the party of your life. And I would suggest that you also then take a month off to do a whole lot of work. I have a few projects coming up. I'm making the tournament masterclass. I have the cash game masterclass on Poker Gojin, which we recently just updated a ton, by the way. We added a bunch of new quizzes. We added some new content. So check that out if you have not. So we're making a tournament version. That is going to be a lot of work, but I'll get it done. I have to get caught up on weekly poker hand, poker coaching quizzes, poker news videos, card player articles, news newspaper articles. Magazine articles. Oh my gosh, I have so much to catch up on. That's what happens when you go away for a while. Actually, the whole last month was just sort of a blur. I went to Nottingham for a while. I, um, the month before that, my parents were in town. Anyway, I have the next three weeks at home to put in a nice, hard grind. And I'm looking forward to that. So yeah, have a great day. Good luck in your games. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, let me know on Twitter at Jonathan Little. If you're in the 30-day challenge and you're still doing it, congrats on that. Consistency is the key to life. If you are more consistent than everyone else, you can be nowhere near as good as them and you'll still crush them. Would you ever consider creating an app to go along with your website? That's been a heck of a project. We're not going to get to the finances of this, but we dumped a load of money into an app and uh, we're still working on it. Anyway, we have an updated Push Fold app coming out very soon along with Quizzes from Poker Coaching that will be available on the iTunes and app, iTunes and Android App Store. Who knows when? Keeps getting delayed. You all are just trying to tilt me today. We talked about tipping. We talked about what was the other one? Well, we talked about apps. One more that tilts me. I already forgot. You see how this is how you have to be if you want to succeed at poker. Things that tilt you, they just like evaporate. They go away. You don't even worry about them anymore. They're gone. Got to be happy. Enjoy your lives. Good luck in your games. Have fun. And I'll talk to you all again on Monday, bright and early, 9 a.m. Eastern time.